morning, everyone. Lovely to see you here this morning on this. Haven't been able to say it on many Sunday mornings, have we? A bright, sunny day. We have the sea on the side, making us all feel very relaxed. And the waves just gently passing us by. And we're all here. Praise God this morning. Lovely to see you. For whether it's the first time you've been here or whether you've been many times before. I'm Liz, one of the worship leaders here. I usually forget to say that, but I've remembered this morning. So it's lovely to see you. Um, we have somewhere a connect form, which if this is your first time here, it would be lovely, oh, she said, juggle all the papers. One of these. If you could fill that in, if this is your first time here, just to let us know who you are, and um, somebody will be really pleased to be in touch with you. So, good morning to you online as well. You can also find this form online, so it'd be lovely to find out more about you. Um, there are several notices this morning, so it's going to be one after the other. So Astrid and Paul, do you want to come up together or? <laughs> I don't know which mic is working, so. You go first. I'll go first. Um, just to remind us that we've been advertising a workshop um, that will equip us to share our faith with those that we uh, work with, or socialize with, those in our families and so on. We've been advertising it for weeks. It is this week. Now is the time. It's on Thursday evening. It's at 7.30. You can sign up for it, or you can just come along. But I'd love to see you there. So this Thursday, 7.30, here. It's the uh, course that we call Turning Ordinary Conversations into Spiritual Ones. So do you come along? All right. Two quick, two quick reminders from me. Um, one is that we are currently in that time of year where we are looking for nominations for the leadership team. And so if you are thinking about nominating somebody, uh, please be praying about this, whether it's in your mind or not. You can get nomination forms from Karen or from the church office, and they need to be back to Karen. I'm looking for Karen for, so I can get a deadline. What's the deadline, Karen? 5th of May. So that needs to happen fairly quickly now, please. Uh, do come and have a chat with one of us if you want to find out more about that. The other thing is that we are in the process of putting together a new church directory, um, and that means we would like to check that your information is up to date, and we would like to give an opportunity for people to become part of the church directory and included if you aren't already. So if this is your church, if you are part of the church family, if this is where your spiritual home is, we would love you to be in the church directory. If you haven't yet asked to do so, please come and have a chat with me after the service. I'll give you the form to fill in and we'll get that sorted out. If you are already in the church directory, there were letters put there about three weeks for you. I've had a look through this morning and there are a surprising number of letters still in there from people who are here in the building every week. So we're going to post those out in the next week if they're left over. I'd much rather not be posting them to people who are here every Sunday, uh, particularly if you're on the leadership team, because that would just be embarrassing. So please do go and pick them up. There is also an opportunity after the service to update your photo in the directory. Most of us have photos in the directory, so when you see a name, you can put it together with a face. It's really helpful in church. Um, and if you would like to update your photo, there will be two photographers in the Parker Hall, which is the smaller of the two halls, about 10 minutes after the service. We're going to give a few minutes for the children's group to clear up, but then about 10 minutes after the serv service finishes, please go in there. We still have photos in the directory that were taken before I came to the church eight and a half years ago. Um, can I gently and pastorally say to you, you do not look like that anymore. <laughs> so please do update your photo. Thank you.
just a reminder we're all getting older. <laughs> Some verses from John. I didn't tell you this earlier because I was with you every day, but now I am on my way to the one who sent me. Not one of you has asked, where are you going? Instead, the longer I've talked, the sadder you've become. So let me say it again, this truth, it's better for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the friend won't come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he'll, explode, he'll expose the error of the godless world's view of sin, righteousness and judgment. He'll show them that their refusal to believe in me is their basic sin. That righteousness comes from above, where I am the with the Father, out of their sight and control. And this week, we have definitely had the friend with us here. Those of you who haven't already spotted this end of the room will wonder what on earth has been going on. Holiday Club has been below the sea this week, and it is, I mean, that is just amazing, isn't it, the setup there? But all sorts of things have been happening, and we have been blessed that the Spirit has been alongside us in everything that has happened. And Ellen is now going to come and tell us a little bit more about uh, what happened, what's going on, etc. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Um, yeah, we've had Holiday Club this last week. Um, we had three days from uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, where we had just the children here and a fantastic team. And yesterday, we invited the children back with their families. Can I just ask very quickly, if you were part of the team in any way, can you just stand up quickly? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, all of these wonderful, wonderful people um, made um, Holiday Club happen um, this last week. Not everyone who was on team is here this morning, probably because they're sleeping, um, <laughs> which is where I would like to be right now. Um, it has been exhausting, um, and I am really, really excited and pleased for this amazing team that have just been so awesome this last week. So thank you very much to them. Please sit down. <laughs> We um, welcomed um, somewhere between 45 and um, 60 children over the week. Um, not exactly certain of the numbers. Um, 60 children were booked in. Um, we didn't have exactly 60 every day, but we saw lots and lots of children connect in with us. Um, our team worked super, super hard um, to build relationship with them, and we learned lots of stories about Jesus and how wonderful he is. Um, one um, lovely little story that I'd like to share with you is that one little girl in one of our small groups um, discovered for the first time this week that Jesus is real and not just a character from a storybook. Um, so that was really, really wonderful, so we were really pleased about that. Um, our set is awesome. It will be disappearing um, later on this afternoon, but um, yeah, so thank you to everyone who got involved. Um, we would love to share with you um, a photo collage um, that's going to come up on the screen now um, with some of our highlights and some of the things that we got up to in Holiday Club, so I hope you enjoy it.
I would hasten to add that that wasn't a new way of baptising when <laughs> Ellen jumped in. <laughs> well, yes, that's... <laughs> No, amazing. Everybody did so many different things. What about the children? Have you got just one very quick thing you would like to say, any of the children, about what you enjoyed about last week? Go on then, Lily. Some really <laughs> gross, messy games, weren't there? Yeah, so, so it seems appropriate that at this point, the song that we're going to start our service with is My Lighthouse. So keeping within the theme of deep sea divers, shall we all stand and sing together My Lighthouse? <laughs> Good morning. Um, thank you. I'm sure you all know the actions to this one very, very well, so we'll be looking out to make sure that um, everyone is nicely warmed up by the end of this song. Shall we just pray? 
say before our young people leave. Heavenly Father, thank you for Holiday Club. Thank you for all we were able to do together last week, all we learned. And Lord, we pray that there will be more this morning, that you will be with everybody who goes out, leaders and children alike, that you will bless them and they will know your presence. Amen. Amen. Okay, off you go. Wherever we're not singing yet. No. <laughs> Sorry, it was Nick. Um, I just think as we have just prayed for the children as they just left. Um, and as adults who were there last week, all sorts of conversations happened, different things happened. I'd just like to spend a short time of prayer, um, praying for um, what could come out of last week. What, what were the conversations that were had? How were the children blessed? So... Even if you weren't there, it would be encouraging to pray for the children and pray for their future. So, should we spend a short time just praying for our children? Please pray out loud if you wish. Father God, thank you for the amazing team that assembled last week, for their skills, for their time, for their enthusiasm. Thank you that you fill them with your spirit and enable them to work through the week with the children and relate to them. And we pray for each and every child who came, that they will have gained something of you, some thought of you, some memory of you, through what they had. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray for that young person who had a raw encounter with you <coughs> because she realised that you are real, not just a story. And Lord God, I just pray that there will be real opportunity for that to be developed for that young person and that a raw relationship will be entered into and nurtured by those people around her. In the name of Jesus. Father, and giving you thanks for the many blessings of friendship that happened last week, for the friendships amongst the children and the friendships between the team leaders and the children. May they continue to flourish in the times ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <coughs> Good morning. Lord, we thank you for each one of those precious children known to you very deeply in their circumstances. Father, I just pray that you will bless them through their lives. Go with them and help them to, um, to know you and to um, be guided by you and loved by you. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Father, for everybody who was involved last week in whatever way, for the conversations that we had, for the questions the children asked. Just pray they will continue to ask questions, that they will continue to seek you, Lord, because that was what we hoped for their future, that they would learn to love you. And as we continue in prayer, I'd like to share a paraphrase of um, Psalm 95 as we are starting a new series today, God of Justice, Justice for All. And in Psalm 95, this is a paraphrase. For equal rights and justice, cry out loud. Then come before God's presence and be glad, and harden not your hearts. Do not be proud, but kneel before your Maker, for he made you for himself and also for each other, to share his good gifts equally. Our God is everyone's salvation, and our Father is Lord and Father equally to all. Let us rejoice before him. Let him, gather, let him gather the scattered tribes and nations back from all the corners of the earth and also from the wilderness of wilfulness. He's called to bring our lives and our whole world to him resounds in all of us. Could we but hear our saviour, king and shepherd, call us home? So as we think about those words, let's think about our world and what's happening at the moment and pray that uh, the world in which we live, which is not at peace, pray for specifically Gaza and the possibility of peace talk that are going on. So pray openly or in your hearts for our world.
be with all those people suffering on both sides, Father. Both sides, but I do pray that you will stop this horrible, bullying and killing that's going on, Father. And be with all those people who are trying to help the people of Gaza. And help them to, to know to all the managed hospitals insufficient food. Just be close and best. Thank you. Father, thank you that you care for each one of us. And it must break your heart to know how many are going hungry. Lord, we pray that food supplies will be finally moved through so that people in Gaza will not be suffering so much, Lord, so much pain, so much hunger. Lord, there are places where here in our country today, um, people are probably <coughs> hungry because their economic situation is such that, um, sadly, food is low on their list of priorities. So we pray that in any way we can, Lord, we can be your people and your hands in this world. Amen. Now Simon and the band are going to lead us in some worship. <coughs> Please stand if you are able. We worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. Of the Lord, our God is showing in this place. If we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up on that cross, then he rose up from the grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be We were the beggars, now we're royalty. 
We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out. Shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Shout out your
Astrid brings word to us this morning. Shall we just pray? Lord, your word is always sweet. Help us to hear you speak to us this morning. Amen. Good morning again. Israel Gaza briefing. Obstacle to peace seem larger than ever after six months of war. Bradford stabbing. Woman aged 27 dies in city center attack. Post office scandal. Bosses earned millions despite Horizon Scandal. Those were three BBC headlines that were on my news app this morning as I checked the news. Justice is a rare commodity. We see it made hopeless in the hollow eyes and the swollen bellies of starving children. We see it violated and exploited by a grown-up who's betrayed a sacred trust we hear it silenced in a false accusation that can destroy a reputation or a life. And if justice is a rare commodity, injustice is common currency. We see it in big business and we see it in petty disagreements. We see it in politics and we see it in the playground. We see it in ourselves and sometimes we see it so much that we hardly see it at, at, at all. In a world where justice is scarce and injustice is commonplace, which direction is God looking? Does he see and does he care? The author, C.S. Lewis, asked those questions when he went through the pain of seeing his wife lose her life to a particularly unpleasant form of cancer. Shortly after she died, he wrote, not that I'm in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not so there's no God after all. The real danger, so, um, sorry, so there's no God after all. But this is what God is really like. Deceive yourself no longer. And maybe this morning you're asking questions like that about God. Wondering if such questions and such doubts and fears can be compatible with a life of faith. If you are, I want to reassure you. Some people might say that faith has to be unquestioning. But the truth is, faith and doubt are two sides of the same coin. Without doubt, faith wouldn't be faith at all. And as we start a new series um, on justice this morning, we're going to eavesdrop on a conversation between an Old Testament prophet called Habakkuk, um, uh, that he, uh, a conversation that he has with God. So I'm going to encourage you, if you've got a Bible um, from our Bible racks at the back of the room, I'm going to encourage you to turn to page 940, because that's where Habakkuk is found. Um, it's easy to miss Habakkuk. His whole three-chapter book is just five pages in our Bibles, but he's got some really helpful stuff to say to us today. While you're finding that, page 940, while you're finding that, I just want to give you a little bit of biblical history because I hope it will help with some context. After King Solomon died, 
around 930 years BC. The kingdom of Israel was split into two parts. The northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. Almost straight away, the northern kingdom of Israel started to follow other religions. And after the prophets like Elijah and Amos failed to get God's people to turn back to God, they were um, invaded and conquered by a cruel and terrible nation called Assyria. Now, a hundred years after all of that happened, um, the southern kingdom of Judah are starting to behave very similarly to the kingdom of Israel. They're failing to follow God's word and they're descending into corruption with injustice and violence on the rise. The threat of the Babylonian empire is on the horizon. And so Habakkuk, who lived around 600 years before Christ, turns to God and he pours out his heart and it's not for the first time. His three-chapter book starts on page 940, and we're just going to dip into these three chapters this morning. So we're going to start in Habakkuk chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 2 to 4. Habakkuk cries out to God, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk is coming to the end of his limit. How long will you remain silent, God, he says. He wants to understand. Why aren't you stepping in and dealing with the, the rising horrors of lawless violence and corrupt litigation, God? And then God comes back to Habakkuk. And he replies, but his response is chilling. Instead of rescuing his people, God is going to allow Babylon to execute justice on God's behalf. And Habakkuk is horrified. What is God thinking? If God's into inaction in the kingdom as it is, is bad enough, why would God use Babylon? It's unthinkable. Babylon treated humans like animals. He talks about them gathering up uh, people like fish in a net. Babylon would just devour nations and people just to build up their empire. And Habakkuk, challenges God again. And this time he appeals to God's holy nature. And we're going to look at Habakkuk 1 and verses 12 to 14. This is Habakkuk's second complaint. He says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my holy one, your will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my God, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You've made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. Habakkuk just can't grasp how a good and a holy God, a just God, can bear to look on evil and use such a corrupt people as his instruments 
in history. And he is grappling with probably one of the hardest things we grapple with as Christians. Why evil and suffering if God is a good God? And that is often thrown at us by critics of Christianity to argue against God. I think one of the most helpful things about uh, Habakkuk is his courage to take the theological teaching of his day and test it against the experience of his own life and what he's seeing in the world that he lives in. He refuses to have a faith without reflection and observation. And although it's really uncomfortable, if we're to be people who develop a deep faith, we have to be able to do the same as well. We have to be able, in the words of the theologian Karl Barth, to take our Bible in one hand and take our newspaper in the other. Read both, but interpret newspapers from our Bible. So we've got to be able to engage with Twitter feeds and Facebook updates and blogs updates and blogs based on science and facts and conspiracies, as well as news from a variety of sources and perspectives, including local gossip and opinion. We must reflect on our own experiences and listen to the story of others. We've got to spend time in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces and in the spaces where we relax and listen to and hear the voices of those around us. If we're to be authentic people of hope and light, we've got to notice the injustice in the world and yet still Reconcile this with God's word. God tells Habakkuk that one day he's going to bring down Babylon and all the Babylon-like empires in the world. For a while, God might use a corrupt nation like Babylon, but it doesn't mean that he endorses everything that they do. In chapter 2, Habakkuk describes some woes of the nations that, um, that exist in his day. And you will recognize countries and nations and people groups that exercise these same woes. He says, woe to those that practice unjust economic practices such as extortion and charging high levels of interest to keep people trapped in debt. He says, woe to people that endorse slave labor, treating people like animals and threatening them with violence if they're not productive enough. He says, woe to the abuse of alcohol by irresponsible leaders partying while people suffer under bad leadership. And he says, woe to those who turn to money and power and national security and make them their gods. The world really hasn't changed much since Habakkuk's day, has it? Hardly at all. But nor has the declaration that God has made, which will hold all nations accountable to his justice. God's authoritative word is found in Habakkuk 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come. And it will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. What Habakkuk is told to, um, to, to pass on is that only those who live by faith are acceptable to God. And it's living faithfully 
that is the most important thing to God in the long run. And Habakkuk finds the idea of waiting terrifying. And maybe we do too. In chapter 3, Habakkuk describes his fear. Um, looking at verse, um, I think it's 16. Let me just <laughs> turn over the page. Nobody's read this in this new Pew Bible yet. Habakkuk says in verse 16 of chapter 3, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Habakkuk is frightened. He's just chilled to the very core of his being in hearing what God is asking him and us to do. And we might feel the same. But then we find a word yet. Yet I will wait patiently for the delay of for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. He goes on to say, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep for the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls. He can't see anything good going on in his world. And then comes that little word again, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. He's terrified. And then Habakkuk's faith steps in. He can't see any evidence of God at work. But then Habakkuk's faith steps in. Despite how dark and chaotic the world and our lives can be, Habakkuk encourages us to see how the very thing we're afraid of invites us into a journey of faith. Habakkuk comes to see how the fear of suffering can draw us into a place of trust that God loves this world and those who walk by faith far more than we imagine. Habakkuk comes to believe that one day, one day, God will deal with all of the world's evil. And so it begs the question, how? How is there such a transformation in Habakkuk from chapter 1 and chapter 2 into this incredible place in chapter 3? And the answer is really simple. Habakkuk remembers. Habakkuk remembers. Habakkuk remembers the story of his people. He remembers how God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. He remembers the miraculous Red Sea crossing. No, he wasn't there, but he remembers. This is the story of his people. This is the story of his faith. He remembers the time that the sun stood still. And so Joshua had more time in daylight to fight the battle and win the battle against the Amorites. And in remembering, Habakkuk chooses to hold on to who God is and what God has done. And if we're to be people who live by faith, we too must know and remember our story. We've got to be people that know and remember the story of God and his people. And it was only last week that we celebrated Easter. We celebrated the empty tomb. And out of that, we can rejoice that our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven. Whoop, whoop. And that is good. 
But that is not all that the empty tomb is about. The empty tomb, Easter, it's more than just you and me. It says God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have triumphed over the whole universe. The heavens and the earth. The empty tomb doesn't only say that we've personally got a future, but God is going to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. And we get to be part of that. That's what the empty tomb says. It says we're on the way to a new creation where disasters and destruction and decay won't be anymore. Evil and injustice will be wiped away. Everything will be made new. This world we live in is a shadow of the world to come. That is our story. That's our story. And we hold that with and alongside what we see in our own lives and what we see going on in the world. We have to remember our story and choose to hold on to God who and who he is, and what he's done. And it's tough, isn't it? It's tough, because we've all seen the evidence of evil in our lives. We've all been touched by evil. We bear its scars, and we're, we're in various different stages of healing from the way evil has touched our lives. Sometimes we find ourselves kind of trapped like in a prison of our own poor choices, desperately trying to move beyond those. Other times we've been downtrodden by the, um, by, by the fallen world that we live in. But the book of Habakkuk reminds us that no place is too dark and no wall too thick for God's grace to penetrate in a powerful and in a life-affirming way. So we might be victims of terrible injustice. We may have experienced the most awful tragedies in our lives. And maybe we struggle with being a powerless bystander, observing suffering helplessly. But we need not be people who live without hope. Hope is found in what God has done and in what is to come. And we're to do this together. We're to support one another. We gather as church to help each other remember our story and who God is. We come together in big church on a Sunday and in small groups midweek to remember because it's remembering that builds our faith. There's a preacher called George Buttrick. No reason why you might have heard of him, but it's good to attribute things to, to people. And he said, the same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. And so we can let suffering and tragedy harden us or soften us. We can be hopeless or we can be hopeful. When we remember who God is and we live in the light of all that his promises say he will do, one of the things it does it is that it helps us move our attention away from ourselves and the troubles that we're facing. It refocuses us on him and it builds our faith. Remembering doesn't only just build faith in an abstract way, though. It empowers our prayer. From fearful complaint, Habakkuk comes to pray boldly. And so we're just going to look at the last bit of Habakkuk um, 
and uh, we're not in the last chapter. We're going to look at Habakkuk verse, uh, chapter 3 even, verse 2. What he starts this prayer that says, I have been turned around in my thinking. What he starts this prayer with are these words. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. From a desperate, how long? Habakkuk now prays, God, bring it on. That is a transformation, isn't it? What a change. And I wonder for us today where we need our how long cries to be turned into the confident prayer of faith. Bring it on, God. Where do we need to be transformed by Hab like Habakkuk into an example of the righteous walking and living by faith? Because it's highly likely that life has disappointed us along the way. Almost undoubtedly, certainly if you're as old as I am, you will find that there have been expectations that have gone unmet. I'm quite sure that we've got questions that God hasn't answered, issues that he hasn't resolved. But we're called to be a people that don't despair. We're called to learn from this prophet called Habakkuk. In the middle of our troubles, we're called to embrace God. That's actually what Habakkuk's name means, one who embraces. We're called to be a people that help one another, come alongside one another, be part, being part of a family where we encourage all of us, to hold on to our faith. Let's pray. Lord, you know all of our individual circumstances and you know how we worry for the world that we live in. Lord, even if we don't understand why, we pray that you would help us today to trust you. Lord, even if we wonder how long, would you help us to believe that you know when? Lord, even when there's no explanation and even when there seems to be no logic or no good reason, even then, Lord, would you help us to trust you? Would you help us to trust you simply because you are God and you are good and you are just and you love us and you love the world that you have created. Lord, despite the world around us, would you transform us into righteous people who live by faith, so like Habakkuk, we can have the confidence to pray, God, bring it on. And whether our prayer is for revival, or for salvation, or for healing, or for breakthrough, or for peace, God, would you turn us into a people that can confidently pray, bring it on. Let us see you working in our day. Amen. You'll notice that I didn't share any personal story, unusually for me. 
And I haven't looked at specific situations or incidences because one of the dangers is that we can get into a comparative kind of mindset. We all suffer. And when we suffer, it is equal to the next because that's our experience. So I'd encourage you, if you're suffering today, to come forward for prayer ministry where somebody can pray for you individually and lift your suffering to God. Please do make a, take advantage of our prayer team who will sit by you and pray. Thanks. If you are willing and able, please stand as we sing our final song together. What a gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to Christmas and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless praise. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and
please take it. And just want to share um, a peak great Sabbath blessing with everybody this morning. May this day bring Sabbath rest to our hearts and homes. May God's image in us be restored and our ima imagination in God be restored. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the relativity of time slow down. May we know grace to embrace our own finite smallness in the arms of God's infinite greatness. May God's word feed us and his spirit lead us into the week and the life to come. Amen. So, whoops, nearly not the standover. Please share this uh, service on whatever social media account you're on and come and join us coffee time down the corridor at the bottom. And if you've got a gift to give, there are boxes on either side or if you do it by card, somewhere around is the magic machine. I think it's probably outside. Okay. And this evening there is um, the Immerse service to which you are all very much invited. And if you would like prayer, these seats at the front will be reserved for prayer. Not just say something for today, just if you want to share prayer with somebody else, please feel free to come and share there. So, God bless you all. Good morning. <laughs>